Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're all are here. And I would like to shout out to all of our ZD team members for making this happen. And also the speakers that we invited that were honored us with their presence today from Ms. Rita Muyambo, our sisters, Dunola, Lynn, and Nur Zorwana, who are all here to share their beautiful experiences. Um, yesterday was International Women in STEM Day, Women and Girls in Science, actually. And this month, Z Zara's Dream decided to actually have a chat with young women who are in their irrespective fields in, in STEM and are making great, great changes. We wanted to find out about their experiences and also how they have been able to navigate as women in this field, a field that is predominantly dominated by men. And to start with, I would like to uh, remind you guys that according to the UNESCO Research Institute, about less than 30% of women worldwide are in this field. And that number even goes down when it's women of color. So I wanted to ask as we go on with this talk, I want you to keep in mind, wow, is it that women find themselves in situations sometimes that they are not able to be fully represented? in this field and what is it that we as young women and girls and also boys can do to make sure that women's voices are heard and they're really represented in this field. And as we keep along with this conversation, I would like to, for us to keep in mind that we should learn, we should be bold, we should embrace our passion and we should also have no fear being bold in the sense that we should take up space and we should be bold in the sense that even when we sometimes find ourselves that we're the odd one out, especially in these type of field, we should still be there, take up room, learn, and we should embrace and follow our passions. And even if it means we're the only one left standing and we should have no fear that we are unstoppable as women and that we can do and achieve anything. And with that, I would like to thank all of the young women and men on this panel that have joined today that are ready to listen and learn from these amazing women that have come today to share their experiences. And with that, I would like to introduce our next, uh, next amazing speaker, Ms. Rita Moyambo. Ms. Rita Moyambo is passionate about human rights for youth and children, gender equality, women and girls empowerment, education, and ending violence against women and girls. She has more than 15 years experience in programming that changes lives, mainstream of gender in various contexts, and a commitment to translating policies into practical action with a special focus on reaching the most vulnerable and marginalized. She's a mentor, advocate for young people's voices, leadership, and agency at a national, regional, and global level. She, she co-evened the first Young Women's Forum at CSW in 20, 2015 and all the sub subsequent ones. Prior to joining UN Women, she was the head of programs for the largest and oldest women's rights movement, Young Women Christian Association, working in 109 countries. Currently, she leads you and women work on youth and faith engagement. Ms. Rita also holds a, an honors degree in psychology and a master's in business leadership. Please, let's give it up for Ms. Rita Muyambo. And Ms. Rita, if you please want to take the floor, it's open up to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm just wondering, my camera is not coming on. I should have tried this before. Uh, use video, okay. Let's see. Um, you know, I tried to go on another link uh, mm -hmm. that you had shared. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's that one that's coming up. Let's see if I close it, leave this one. Okay, leave this one as well. Okay, um, is my camera on now? Um, no, Not I can't. Uh, okay, start my video. Okay, okay. perfect, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And um, I mean, I'm 
completely wowed by uh, what you girl, you know, what you're doing. And thank you for the warm and generous introduction as well. I do feel privileged to be on this panel with you amazing young leaders. Completely, completely amazing. Um, I have my own story after high school and wanted to study math and chemistry, but I suppose it's a story for another day. I would like to start by quoting my Carol Jameson, the first black woman to travel into space when she served uh, as a mission specialist aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour, and I'm sure you all know about her. She said, never be limited by other people's limited imaginations. If you adopt their attitudes, then the possibility won't exist because we have already shut it out. You can hear other people's wisdom, but you've got to reevaluate the world for yourself. She goes on to say, don't let anyone rob you of your imagination, your creativity or your curiosity. It's your place in the world. It's your life. Go on and do all you can with it and make it the life you want to live. And I suppose this is part of the conversation today. So I think as you uh, alluded to, I think in the beginning of your, uh, your introductions, that the 11th of February was International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So this UN designated day aims to accelerate gender equity and improve access to and participation in science for women and girls. And so that is why this day is so important, but also why is it important to reflect globally? And I think you also alluded to part of that, the percentage of female Females among science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates is below 15% in over two thirds of countries. In middle and higher income countries, only 14% of girls were top performers in science and mathematics expected to work in science and engineering compared to 26% of top performing boys. There is a lot of research that has been done looking at the barriers, and I am sure this is part of the discussion and our amazing panelists are going to be speaking to that, so I'm not going to go into that. However, it's important to note that young women are less likely to continue their studies to the doctorate level, even though they are more likely than young men to gain bachelor's and master's degrees in science and research. Secondly, Women who become scientists are less likely than men to remain scientists. And there are multiple reasons to that. And as a result, only around 29% of today's researchers worldwide are women. And thirdly, women scientists and researchers are more likely to work in academia or public sector, while men more, are more likely to work in the private sector, which offers higher salaries and greater opportunities I'm sure we're also aware of that. So I was just Googling as well, and I found this um, in a way it was indicated that just a simple search of the word on female scientists will yield the list of 17 famous female scientists who helped change the world or 10 women in science and tech who should be household names. But if you go further and do another search, uh, of the most famous male scientists today. The list talks about the most influential scientists or the top 10 greatest scientists with no mention of the word male. So gender parity in science and research is crucial. And it's a step that we need to look at, especially if you want to achieve the SDGs. Gender parity in science would be a major contribution to SDG 5, which aims to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. It's also a support SDG 9, which promotes innovation, SDG 17, which promotes statistical capacity building to meet the pressing needs for more and better data. So the burden of improving gender diversity in STEM shouldn't be placed on women's shoulders but systemic change can be slow and that is why at UN Women we focus on amplifying young women's leadership, voice and agency. In such days as these offer us an opportunity to share some of the work that we are doing. We do programming in different countries where we are encouraging girls and young women to pick up STEM subjects at school. 
We partner with different organizations and governments that are promoting education at global, regional, and country work. So I will share with you a couple of examples of what we are doing in the different countries. Uh, for example, in Africa, we have uh, the Africa Girls Can Code Initiative, a joint program with the Africa Union Commission, UN Women Ethiopia, and the International Telecommunication Union. It's a four-year program and it's designed to keep young girls with digital literacy, coding, personal and development skills. And through our Generation Equality Action Coalition on Innovation and Technology, we are partnering with a number of organizations and governments who have made commitments to that action coalition. We are working, for example, with Digital Grassroots, which has committed to building the capacity of future internet leaders by engaging a thousand young women in programs to strengthen internet literacy, internet um, health projects, and to imp implement action research and gender equality, gender equality in the internet governance by 2026. We're also working with the Global Fund for Women who have committed to mobilizing funds to fund gender justice movements, advancing feminist tech and innovation, launching three multilingual gender justice labs, and to launch a hashtag system reboot, a campaign to engage global audience in feminist tech and organizing. We'll also be supporting Rwanda who committed to bridge the gender gap in digital access by 2026 in three specific areas of ownership of smartphones, access to digital financial services, and STEM studies at upper secondary level. And finally, we'll be supporting Finland who have committed to supporting the goals of the Generation Equality Forum, implementing bold national collective commitments to bridge the gender digital divide. So for you amazing leaders, continue being confident in what you do, claim credit for your ideas. Do you know that only 82% of women in STEM say their contributions are ignored? So claim credit for that brilliant idea. Invest in peer networks. Networking is important. I'm sure you all know about that. You need to build your relationships. You need to increase trust that will lead to buy-in and give you results that you want. Be authentic on your brand. That is so important. In an ideal world, the presence of women in science would pass without a comment. And we need to change that. We need a new normal. Until then, however, the International Day for Women and Girls in Science is vital to promote gender parity in a sphere that demands the world's brightest and best. And you are those people. So thank you. And I wish you the best of luck for the rest of the session. Thank you very much, Ms. Rita. That was amazing. Thank you so much. And as she said, be authentic and claim your ideas. Definitely. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, from our Zahara Stream team members, our sister Sue, who is our engagement lead, and our sister Essie, who is our newsletter lead. If you can, you guys can please take the floor. Thank you, Ago. Um, thank you, Ms. Rita. That was a really amazing opening, the keynote speech, and we're really encouraged um, um, to you know, provide more opportunities for women in STEM uh, and provide a platform um, to pursue their dreams and sustain their careers in this field. Um, so that being said, without further ado, uh, let me introduce um, our, um, the first speaker, um, that is Noor Zavana Zabidi. Um, so Noor Zavana is currently pursuing her PhD in Manash University, Malaysia, under the supervision of Professor Sunil K. Lal. The current research project focuses on investigating the interactions between influenza A virus and human heat shock proteins as a means of understanding in depth the disease pathogenesis to find a potential therapeutic strategy. Um, so apart from being in the research labs, she has been actively involved in teaching undergraduate students and committees striving for science communication and women's empowerment. Um, I'd like to call upon my colleague Essie to introduce the rest of the speakers.
Thank you, Sue. Uh, hi, I'm Essie, and I'll be introducing Lynn and Danola. So we'll start with Lynn. Uh, Lynn is a researcher, a technologist, a writer, and a speaker. She's passionate about encouraging more African women to realize the potential of technology and contribute to um, its design. And she's also a PhD candidate in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon. And she's also spent 10 years working in the industry as a software and front end developer. Uh, Danola is the chair of um, the AVAST Foundation's Youth Leadership Board, which works towards digital safety and freedom for young people. She's also the digital inclusion, um, she's on the digital inclusion, inclusion team at the ITU. And she's previously worked as a financial analyst in the UK National Audit Office, as well as Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs Investment Bank. So we're very happy to speak to you all because, you know, I'm also a woman in tech, so I'm super excited. Um, so I'll take, uh, I'll give the floor back to Sue to start asking the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Essie. Um, so what's super, super thrilled to have you all, uh, Zavana, Danola, and Lynn. Thank you so much. We're grateful for your um, partnership to conduct this program. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into our first question. Um, so we want to start off by asking how each one of you uh, got started in your field. Um, so we'll start with uh, Zavana and then Danola and to Lynn. Zavana, over to you. All right, thank you, Sue. Um, so I'm currently doing my PhD in molecular virology, but how it initially started was, uh, so we start off with my pre-U qualification, which I did an IB diploma, which stands for International Baccalaureate Diploma. And after that, I, for the undergraduate years, I took a Bachelor of Science in Medical Bioscience and Biotechnology. And after that, I did an honors year. So all of my undergraduate honors year and PhD, I've been in the same institution in Monash University, Malaysian campus. I'm basically a dinosaur there by now because it's been about 10 years. Um, so after undergraduate, I continued with one extra honors year by research. So a distinction to make here is that for Australian unis is that sometimes they separate the honors year and the bachelor's year, but for um, I think universities from the UK is that they combine it together. So for me, it was separate. Uh, so I took one extra year to do research. And after that, I um, enrolled as a PhD student. Um, usually you can continue, you can start off with master's uh, and during your master's, you can switch to a PhD. So postgraduate in STEM is actually pretty flexible. Yeah, so that's how I'm here now. Thank you, Zawana. And Dinola, what about you? Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for inviting me. I'm really privileged and excited to be in such an amazing event alongside incredible people. Um, so hearing everyone's got a PhD except me <laughs> is making me realize I'm really not a tech person. So if anyone's here that you know is not a super tech, that has tech background, I guess I'm your person. <laughs> like, because yeah, I studied economics. Um, and I started my career um, in finance and I did some investment banking and so on. And then um, I just basically, you know, started my, um, my organization, which is a charity here in Luton in the UK, which focuses on the economic empowerment of women and girls. Then I started getting interested in international development issues and issues around in inequality. Well, I've always been passionate about these things, but I just started kind of speaking up more about it and um, working more in this. And then I, decided that the things I was doing kind of on the side of my job were interesting me more and more along the lines of my passion than like my job in banking at the time. And so I ended up getting a scholarship um, to China. Um, it's a, called the Schwarzman Scholarship to study global affairs. So I was at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And then I graduated. I, I did that because I wanted to transition from um, a career in finance into a career um, kind of an international development and I graduated into a pandemic and had zero leads and didn't know what to do <laughs> and you know we started re regretting everything that I did thinking why didn't I just stay in a stable job but then um, some opportunities um, opened up for me 
um, including a part-time role um, at the ITU. I'd never heard of the ITU before. I wouldn't call myself a tech person. So the fact that um, I eventually got um, you know, this part-time role working on the team that was creating the International Center for Digital Innovation at the ITU, which is the International Telecommunications Union, which is the UN agency for ICTs and tech. I was just thinking, you know, I can't code, I don't know nothing about tech. Um, but here I am, you know, I did the project, it was only a three-month thing, but I en ended up um, really Kind of enjoying the work that I was doing on the digital inclusion side and to cut the long story short um, now it's you know I think going to like a year and a bit maybe get, we're getting close to two years now that I've been working at the ITU I'm now working um, specifically in the digital inclusion team specifically on the work that we're doing with youth advising on the digital policy um, and really amplifying young voices and the digital development dialogue and my work with Avast basically Avast is a big cyber security company and with a foundation I'm on the youth leadership board where we're really um, working towards the digital safety and freedom of everyone especially young people so I'll stop there <laughs> thank you so much that's amazing and Lynn what about you um so I uh my journey started a little bit early uh when I saw my first computer I think I was uh, maybe five, six, seven around there. And I was just fascinated. And I really, really, really wanted to do whatever, whatever computer people do. Uh, but I didn't get to touch my first computer until high school. Um, and it wasn't even for computer class. It was more like email time or surf the web time. Um, and, um, while at high school, um, uh, I'm from Uganda, so Makerere University in Uganda had introduced um, the Battle of Information Technology. And my dad was like, you should you should do this course since you've always wanted to be a computer wizard. That's what we were calling it. Um, and yeah, so I had a bit of a dip there. I did not pass high school. And so I had to do a diploma first before um, getting a bachelor's. Um, and then after that, ended up working in um, like front end development and um, uh, and social media because that was new at the time. Um, but I, I think I got to a point where I was a little bit bored <laughs> and I wanted a more of a challenge. Um, and so I said, you know, it would be great if we could do a master's um, and specifically focus the master's on something else to do with tech. So I've been doing front end development, but I really didn't think of myself as a software engineer. And that's what everyone was. So I was like, I am going to look for a degree that will give me a master's in software engineering. Um, and so I did that in Rwanda. Um, and shout out to UN Women. I am a tuition support scholar. Um, they uh, funded my master's uh, tuition. Um, and then after that, I really wanted to give back to the community. So I went back home to Uganda um, and uh, worked as a software engineer. So the dream worked. Um, but then give myself like two years. I was like, after two years, I'll reevaluate and see if I'm still interested um, in continuing this specific journey. I was not. Um, and that's where the PhD journey started because I realized that, um, you know, there's not a lot of people writing about uh, the African context, not a lot of Africans writing about the African context. Um, and in the specific field that I'm in, human computer interaction, it's even rarer. Um, and so like, well, that's a new challenge. Let's try that. Um, I, I, I urge you do not do not start PhDs like that. It's probably not a good idea. But um, yeah, it, that's that's how I got here. I'm still here close to the finish line. So um, it's working out. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I think um, that opened up like a whole new um, forum where you know people could connect to how you know you go through the struggle and then you figure it out you figure things out at your own place and then how you finally sustain right without uh, letting it put you off so great thank you lynn um so i think lynn and Danola a little bit touched upon my second question which was going to be okay what inspired you to pursue this career but zavana i would like to quickly pose this question to you could you just tell us like what inspired you to take up science 
Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, I never saw myself doing science. Health sciences, yes. I am the stereotypical Asian, raised in an extended family full of doctors. And I wanted to be that. I wanted to specialize in pediatrician until my imagination went overboard and I started to actually imagine bleeding and people getting hurt. And I realized that my anxiety will just shoot through the roof. And instead of helping the patient, I'll just be panicking along with them. Uh, but I still wanted to stick to health sciences. I was interested in studying uh, infectious diseases and how to find cures for them. So instead of being on the scene, I want to be behind the scene. So that's how, um, you know, finding out what happens within the biomedical sciences and how diseases develop or how to cure them is how I got interested in where I am now. Thank you. Thank you, Zoana. Um, so my next question is to Demola. Um, you've had various roles within finance and now with the UN International Telecommunication Union. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's looking uh, to grow their career in these male dominant industries? That's a really tough question because I think um, everyone has different paths and everyone has different experiences and for example, you know, I had a really terrible um, work experience in one of my previous roles when I was in banking, like really, really terrible. Um, and, and it's like one of like the most difficult banks to get into. So still to this day, I have on LinkedIn loads of girls messaging me going, oh, I've got my interview for, for this um, investment bank. Can you please, you know, help me? And, you know, especially, you know, I was on the trading floor, I could see there's not much, especially black women there. So I want there to be more black women there and, you know, women in general there. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, can I in good conscience, like, wish this, like, you, you know, what happened to me, but I'm thinking, no, that happened to you. That may not happen to them. They may be in a wonderful team, you know, and so it's really tough. Because, even if I was to say, okay, in this job I'm doing, I'm having a fabulous time. It doesn't mean someone else will go into that role and have a fabulous time. So um, it's it's a really tough one in terms of giving advice. But I think the 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 the, the best thing that I can say is, well, one of the, the the first things is really, even if you're enjoying something, right? it's always important to think of the actual job itself and if you're growing and if you feel like it's in the best interest of you know whatever you feel your purpose is in life and what you want to achieve and what you feel you want to contribute to the world that's a mouthful but basically what I'm trying to say is this <laughs> um I, I was I had another job in finance before that job where I was pretty much comfortable you know I had a lovely team and everything and the reality is I would have probably still been in that role till today um, but I had to experience some sort of friction <laughs> before I actually realized actually this day to day is not for me right and, and, and I kind of thought actually with even if I had a wonderful team I should have still asked myself this question as to how important it is so when you're starting off your career, you probably you know need to experience so many things. You don't know what you may not know what exactly your passion is, what exactly you're going to spend the rest of your time doing. The key things to ask yourself is just: Am I learning here, and is this in line with what I think at this point in time is my may not be your end goal. You may have thought that 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 for, but where I want to be in the near future, and always assessing yourself that way. In terms of male-dominated fields, especially if you're someone working um, in a country where you're an ethnic minority and other intersectionalities, a religious minority and so on, it's tough. And even now, personally, I found that, you know, for example, in the UK, we have Black History Month, we have Women's Month, we have all these wonderful things, and you will be in a place, you know, hopefully we will, we will not be for many much, but the reality is you might find yourself in a place where they're celebrating all these things and saying the right things, but you know how you feel when you go in there and you know how you, you feel in social situations and how the subtle exclusions and so on. The second thing I would say in terms of tackling male dominated fields is finding your tribe in there. I had my one friend at this toxic place of work I will not mention. And you know, we kept each other sane 
um, she was just an amazing person. And to, to this day, if she wasn't there, I don't know what, how much more worse I, I would have felt. So no matter how small, um, it's important that you don't go through it alone, even if your whole entire workplace is not exactly you know inclusive and so on if you want to stay in that role and of, of, of course it's a privilege to even have a way out some people don't have a way out try to find a tribe in there try to speak to, to someone even if it's on an informal basis that's my key tips for male dominated <laughs> office spaces or whatever that might not be the most inclusive <laughs> thank you so much that was amazing. Um, so I completely, completely agree with you as to how I think in any field, um, you it's it's being a woman, especially with being a woman of color, it's easy to feel like an outsider the whole time. Um, so I think it's very, very important, like you very correctly said, to reflect on yourself, on your path, where you want to go, and you know, then evaluate if this experience will add value to it, and then you know, do what you have to do. So thank you so much. Um, so with that, I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, Essie, to continue. Thank you, Sue. Um, I would just like to piggyback off of uh, Zawana's question, um, answer. You had mentioned how, you know, you had so many doctors in your family, but what do you think that women need to have known or experienced to get into science or specifically virology as a career? Uh, I think that when uh, back in high school, it's quite typical that you only hear lawyers and doctors and lawyers and doctors just on and on. But actually STEM is not as superficial or as as rigid as it may seem. And it covers a lot, lot more diverse areas. So I can speak for science itself. You have like food science. You have microbiology, which microbiology, if you really focus on it, you have viruses, you have bacteria and fungi, uh, you have genetics, chemistry, environmental sciences, and there is just so much to explore that the research on these areas might not be in your country, but it might be elsewhere. So don't uh, like close your mind towards looking only what's within your area, but also what's outside there. So if you feel like you have a certain passion, like what Lynn said for like computers, you know, maybe in a particular area, you know, that's not where it's popular, but somewhere else it is. So go there, go where your interest is. Yeah, that's what I would say. Fabulous, thank you so much. Um, I think that it's so important that people, or at least young women have um, knowledge about you know, go and find where your passion is, even if it's not anywhere that you can see it or it's around you, just follow it. So thank you very much. Um, Lynn, so you've had cross-disciplinary cross uh, experiences and studies in technology. What kind of obstacles have you experienced and how have you overcome them? And how do you think that also informs user experience? What time do we have? Um, I think, I think, uh, one of, one of the, one of the largest obstacles I think that I've faced, um, is often being overlooked or, um, because my personality is more, um, uh, like quiet. Uh, and so you have, you walk into some of these spaces and, uh, you're not loud enough or, um the the way you're told to thrive there is to adapt to change yourself um and i don't agree with that um uh so i've often found like um you know people just either talking louder than you or you know completely overlooking the idea that you bring to the table um, and then, you know, circling back many weeks later, uh, and you're like, we, we just wasted so much time. We could have just, like, why, why didn't y'all listen? Um, and I think, you know, like, like, um, like Danala said, you find your tribe and you echo, like, use them, like, as a, as a, um, as a place for you to just check that what's happening is actually happening, um, like a sounding board. Um, and yeah, 
yeah, because I think your environment will help you, will either help you thrive or not, right? And so if, if, if you're in some of these spaces um, where you realize that you're constantly being talked over or you're constantly being dismissed, um, it's, it's also a brave thing to leave. <laughs> Um, it's also a brave thing to just take a, take a step away. And um, I've had to do that as well. Um, it's not great, but it, it yeah. <laughs> you, you end up picking up the pieces and you move on because that experience, um, for me at least in my, in my personal experience, those types of experiences have taught me places that I will not, like I am not willing to compromise there and now I know that right and so the next place that I end up going to um yeah they have a higher standard that they have to meet and I know that right so I know that internally and that's what I will be looking for and so um I think for uh other people uh coming up with STEM um young girls uh sometimes it, it, it starts with you and knowing what you're not willing to trade off and then seeking to either create those environments or ask specifically for those environments. That's so powerful, Lynn, and I completely agree with you. That hit to the heart. Um, it, it really is really impactful when you kind of see your worth in the space that you're in and not only ask for it, but demand for it. So thank you. Um, Danola. So what skills do you think as a woman in these male dominated industries, um, do you think sets you apart? First, I just want to say what Lynn said is so powerful um, about it kind of starting from, from you, because after some experiences, my time when I was doing my master's was actually a time for me to reflect, not blaming myself for what happened to me, but just trying to just reflect on, on, on the situation. And a lot of it I started to realize was because the whole time I just felt so grateful, like, oh, I'm so lucky to be here. I'm so lucky I have this job. And so they can treat me anyhow, <laughs> you know, they can do anything. And I'll just, I'm just so lucky and so grateful. And I'm just going to just stay here and experience this horrible um, atmosphere. And what she said is so on the nose in terms of when your own kind of belief in yourself and your own confidence in just what you bring to the table and just who you are, you don't have, you know, you don't have to be, you know, doing cartwheels or whatnot, but just who you are is enough, like you're worthy of respect and just understanding that helps you, you know, really kind of set that bar. So yeah, that really hit to the heart. <laughs> but in terms of, of what um, sets everyone apart, so I know there's been loads of you know studies and so on. I did my thesis on female leadership in China, and there are so many um, skills. I think that's stereotypically female skills. Like people say, oh, you know, females are so much more like you know have like stronger soft skills and communication skills, and you know, males are so much more technical and all these things. Personally, I I think some of these constructs, though they say, oh, that's why it's good to have a female leader because they just have better soft skills. I think even having those ideas can be just really dangerous in general because then, as we know, so many of the skills that are praised so much in men are often criticized and looked down upon when women have them. Like if you're um, assertive, you know, they will be like, oh, you're aggressive. And especially if there's an in another intersectional stereotype attached, like, oh, a black woman at work who's been assertive, she's just so aggressive and all these things. So I just try to stay away from like stereotypical skills that might set one apart. And I think, it, again, keeping it as kind of like level as possible, the key things that I think stand out the most are, and again, it's gonna sound so like, like a TED talk kind of thing, but just literally being, authentic oh you know buzzword authentic ha, ha, ha. but yeah <laughs> being authentic being yourself because I think an extra layer of pain was I was trying so hard to be like the perfect like colleague that's not saying not saying too much and just like you know sending the emails and but it's like it just wasn't me fitting in that mold and one of the things I love so much about my, my job right now is like I'm my 100% self and I feel 100% myself and you just it's just so freeing because I, I mean 
anyone who's going through that in your job where you, you, you just have to feel like, okay, now I have to put on my work face so I can go to work and dial into teams. And, you know, that's so, like, you're never free, like, for, us, for a lot of us spending hours <laughs> at work every day. You know, you only get a few hours in the day not to be yourself. So, yeah, I think the key things that kind of sets you apart, even for your own sanity as well, is just really finding that place that you can just completely be yourself of course we you know with professionalism and all that but just to be able to feel you don't feel that tight knot of like this isn't me and like you're internally rolling your eyes when things are happening that's that's not a healthy position to just be for years and years and years thank you Danola. that's so insightful as someone who you know, regularly puts on my work suit every day. <laughs> I hope to be working towards that place that you have landed at. So really happy. I'm gonna pass this on to Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, so no, um, Savannah, sorry. Um, do you have a network of women in science? Um, and are there resources at Monash specifically, that encourage, encourages these communities? Uh, yeah, so Monash established, um, a, a, okay, it's not a society, they keep it casual, uh, called the Women's Empowerment Network, uh, starting in 2019. And um, when they founded the network, I myself was the secretary for three years, and I actually just resigned, like, uh, maybe like a week ago. Um, so basically what the network does is they, they're built on a number of pillars. So the development pillar where they give advice on your personal and career development. They have the well-being pillar which focuses on your um, physical, mental and emotional well-being. And you also have the community pillar which has the community outreach. So um, this particular network caters to not just the staff, but also the postgraduate students. And it's been really helpful because they have been giving advice on, they've had talks on how to journal or how to like manage your emotions. And particularly during the pandemic, I think a lot of us had that journey of self-discovery where we were like, you know, what are we doing? And am I really at the place where I want to be? And I think those talks really helped kind of give an insight to where you should go for yourself. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think it's very, very important. I mean, I, I'm great, uh, like I feel great that you, you've been a part of such a network and it's helped you grow and you've been inspired by it. Um, and for everyone out there, it's, it's very important that you find these networks and communities and associate with them so that um, you form a community, you have people to support you, uh, to navigate, you know, challenges that, you know, you, you, you face um, while you try to, you know, steer through your career or your life in general. So thank you, uh, Zavanna. Um, moving on, uh, Lynn, as someone who is actively using engineering and technology to make the world more inclusive, uh, what do you enjoy the most about your research? Uh, uh, getting a PhD student to talk about their research. Um, I love the methods. I am 100% uh, sold out for the methods. And I'm hoping that my next career gig will be teaching the methods um, just because they help you. So sometimes as engineers, uh, we get tunnel vision about technology and we believe that technology is always the answer, but sometimes it's not. And for you to understand that it's not the answer, you need to talk to people, right? You need to sit down with people and HCI, um, human computer interaction as a field um, is about humans interacting with computers, right? Not just the computers. Um, and so, you know, things like ethnographies, like going out and just sitting with people and asking them. So, you know, I heard you use YouTube. What do you use YouTube for? Um, there was a time my mom was using YouTube um, to learn about mushroom farming. 
And that just blew my mind because I don't go to YouTube to look for mushroom farming techniques, right? Um, and, you know, like when you understand these contexts, the other thing is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is huge in certain parts of the world. And it's also used for business. It's used for communicating. It's, it's you know, cheaper to call on WhatsApp for some people than to make a long distance phone call. So when you understand these contexts and these nuances, you're able to think about how what needs people have and whether or not you can meet those needs with existing technologies or do you need to create like do you need to invent something new um, to meet those technologies um, my current favorite thing and I'll end on this one as you can see I'm, I'm excited even my hands are moving um, my current favorite thing is twitter spaces and how I'm seeing people use them for civic discourse and engagement, which is not really a huge thing in certain um, countries, uh, just because of the nature and the histories around politics in these countries. And to see um, young people want to have these conversations, want to comment on these conversations, um, it's inspiring. But then you also see Twitter spaces that are just about you know, something random, like a hobby um, or, you know, entertainment. And so these different nuances are the things that, like, they increase my blood pressure and they get me happy. So, yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Great. Thanks for sharing that. I think a lot of us are also really excited about Twitter spaces. Um, you know, also like, you know, I think it, it's, it's, it's a safe space for you to just go and talk because you don't know anybody. Nobody's going to judge you there. You just go and speak what you know and you feel good about it after letting it out. So on you, with you completely. Um, so I'm just realizing that we're running out of time, but I, I like we would love to speak to you all day long. Um, so just to ask a few more questions and then to, you know, sort of wrap the panel discussion up, let me pass it on to SE. SE, over to you. Thank you. So I guess um, for each one of you, and uh, we'll start with uh, Sawana, I wanted to ask you whether or what specifically would you tell to your younger self um, about embarking on this journey that you have? Yeah. Um, so this is actually following what Lynn and Nola said, uh, which was when you start your postgraduate journey or your career for that matter, is that no matter how mentally prepared you think you are, <laughs> there will be events that come your way which will which will just shake you, it will break you, and it will make you feel like maybe you're lonely or that you're, that it's almost the end of the world, but actually it's not. And it's very hard to see that when you're in the midst of that storm. But later on, when you look back, you realize that it's actually just to mold you into someone who is a lot stronger and hopefully for someone to discover who they really are, that, that's outside from what people tell you who you should be, but really what you want to be for yourself. And I think generally being in your 20s, which is also something that I tell myself, is that it's supposed to be wonky and confusing and comparing yourself to others does not help at all. So that's the time for you to really take a step back. Just take it slow. It's okay to take it slow. You don't have to be on the same pace as everybody else and just figure it out from you to you and only for you. That's amazing, Soana. Thank you so much for that. Um, over to Lynn. Um, Rana, I 100% agree with everything you said. I um, would take like a similar, a similar route, right? I would tell myself, slow down, take your time. Um, I feel like when I was in my 20s, everyone had their lives figured out. Everyone knew their purpose. Everyone knew exactly where they would be in five years. I did not. I was taking it like literally, I could only see what was in front of me. Um, when I look back now, I'm like, hey, it worked out, but I just wish I had given myself that peace of mind that I am where I need to be right now. Slow down. Um, and then the other thing is you, 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 it, it's okay to be you. Like it's, it's okay to have 1,001 interests and just 
sit and like get so overwhelmed. You like you like technology, you like VR, virtual reality, you like augment, like you want to do it all. It's it's okay to be that person. Um, it's okay to have these crazy interests. It's okay to um, you know, love music and love tech. And maybe that intersection will be a thing that you bring. And so you don't need to change yourself to fit the mold that everyone else has created. I will end there. Thank you so much, Lynn. And I think that is something that I would tell to my younger self as well. <laughs> um, Danola, please, the floor is yours. I'm just loving all this inspiration. Oh my days, <laughs> like, yeah, no, I think similar. Um, literally, it's all gonna be okay in the end. And if it's not yet okay, it's obviously not yet the end. And, you know, it's okay to really be, be you and just to kind of like build on what's already been said by the amazing panelists. It's just, I wish I could tell myself that all the things that I was super insecure about and the environment around me made me feel like it was so ugly and terrible and everything were actually like, kind of like, like superpowers. And the things that I was like, just not really kind of proud of like for example being a dark-skinned girl um growing up here um in in um Luton I know what I went through and you know you just look in the mirror and just think and when you look around you even when you when you look academically at the people that you might want to aspire to at a time when there weren't that many role models in different fields and so on um the things that I thought were going to hold me back and like were like you know things I should be insecure about actually are things that I'm so excited and pleased with that set me apart today so just if there's anything um you know to young girls out there that that makes you you know really feel othered um just don't let society dictate to you what's special and what's not and what's valuable and what's not the true value is literally you because there's never been anyone like you and there never will be you're an original and that's the beauty of you of who you are and that's the beauty of life the fact that there's billions of us but no two are the same even identical twins like how exciting is that so yeah <laughs> thank you so much Nella. that really really means a lot especially because you know we're just reinforcing the fact that we're all unique and to lean into that uniqueness and otherness when society is telling you that other is bad so thank you so so much and i could talk to all you ladies for hours and hours um but i'll, I'll hand it over to verlin to give the the closeout I have to say it's hard to say goodbye. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marlene Diane Soboido. I'm the founder of Zara Stream. Um, I'm so excited. Of course, I'm inspired. I have some tears in my eyes. Uh, I was behind my camera just cheering on everything that I was hearing. Congratulations, of course, to the uh, amazing team. Our sister, Agustina, the managing director of Zara Stream, for bringing all of this together with an amazing team, our sisters, SC and Sue for, of course, guiding the conversations and of course our speakers, Lynn, uh, Noor uh, and Duno, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your insights uh, for today's discussions. I'm not gonna take too long. I think you've shared so much with us, uh, three main things that, um, that I'd like to share perhaps to close based on everything that you've shared. The first one is freedom, the freedom to remember who we are, the freedom to remember our dreams and the freedom to be able to pursue what we want to pursue. The second one that really struck through the conversation was creativity, uh, the desire to go beyond uh, borders, beyond anything that um, defines us, that doesn't necessarily belong to us. So the freedom and creativity to go beyond all of that. And the last one is of course, uh, solidarity and sisterhood. And I think Dunola, you also extensively spoke about it, about finding your tribe and making sure that you find like-minded sisters and brothers. We have some on the call today, John, Kenneth, uh, and build forward together. And those elements really help us to redefine the world around us and to build um, the world that we envision, you know, individually and collectively. And today's Zara Stream is also the product of a collective dream. So thank you so much for everyone who joined our celebration. Um, 
I'm going to perhaps call on Agostina to, 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 to close. Thank you so much and have a beautiful weekend. Thank you very much. We, first of all, I would like to shout out to all of ZD team members, the speakers. You guys are amazing. You rock. This was perfect, beyond perfect. I can't even thank all of you enough. I'm so emotional right now. And particularly to all of the speakers, to what you guys, each and everyone said, it's something that I feel like as young women and men, we are all currently going through that we should stand firm in our belief. And as I said earlier, even if we're the odd one out, still stand by what you believe and pursue your passion and what you are about, because that is what will make you shine at the end of the day. And I would like to thank all of the participants, the speakers, and also be on the lookout for the month of March. We have an event coming up in collaboration with Women's History Month. So please be on the lookout for that. And thank you very much once again, everybody. And always, as we say at Zahra's Ring, always be you powerfully. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you all so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you, guys. Let me end this. Bye, Sue. Bye, Essie. Bye, Aime. Thank you. Bye.